the Chateau of Versailles, my Galsine's palace, at summer solstice, shall flame into the sky and nothing there remain. The king thinks his vision of a madman, the fruit of a fanciful imagination. Unleash Bonton with all his hoard. Twill be in vain, for time is running out, and I defy the star-like king with all his whirling planets to find the riddle of the scheme with titles, heads, and Aesop's words that set alight my flaming brands, the frogs and Jupiter. <laughs> it reads like the raving of a lunatic. My service to the king prevents me from looking into this matter. I want you, Lalonde, to take charge of it. As a valet of the bedchamber, you can move about without hindrance. You know the shadow, its people, and its Customs. Ask endless questions and report to me when you find anything suspect, but be careful. Don't spread the rumor that a madman is threatening the king. Make haste. You have only one day. Eight and a half hours of the clock. No, your brutal methods will not restore peace in the kingdom. Rest assured, the king has spoken of sending Monsieur de Durard to the Duke de la Force. I assure you, he will not obtain the Duke's convert. <laughs> The king's rising from bed ceremony ended with his ablutions. Before the eyes of the courtiers admitted among the first entrance, the barber groomed his majesty before putting on his shawl. Then room was made for the king to proceed to the salon for the robing ceremony. Authorized courtiers joined the company while his majesty partook of a light collation. Each hoped for a glance from the king, inquired after his health, and listened to or spread the rumors of the day. The king, exposed to the public, performed his usual role. He was shaved, washed, and then dressed. Once dressed, the king returned to his bedchamber for a brief morning prayer. Once he had said his prayers, the king, followed by his ministers, went to the council chamber where matters concerning the kingdom were discussed. When the robing was over, the king went to the council chamber. Surrounded by his ministers, he managed the affairs of the state. The doors were shut to ensure secrecy. The most important of his ministers, the Marquis de Lofois, announced the agenda for the day. Gentlemen, be seated and listening. In the meantime, the courtiers awaited His Majesty's appearance in the hall. Gentlemen, the King! It is noon. The King goes to Mass. The court form a train behind him. His Majesty, accompanied by princes and princesses, crosses the grand apartment on his way to the chapel. If your Majesty would be so kind as to look at this petition, I beseech your Majesty on behalf of my nephew, who is the victim of a terrible trial. We shall see, Monsieur. We shall see. The king took his place in the royal gallery. And the princes and princesses ranked behind him in order of hierarchical precedence. The king forbade talking and recommended devotion. During the mass, the officers of the royal kitchen, roasters, bakers, and their assistants were busy preparing the dinner. The food not eaten by the sovereign, whose appetite was legendary, would feed others, and ordinary people did not disdain to purchase leftovers from the kitchens. The public dinner was a spectacle that all the courtiers hastened to attend. Gentlemen, the king's meat!
Only members of the royal family could sit at the sovereign's table, and only duchesses could sit before him. Well, my son, are you preparing a fine carousel for us? During this main dinner, three different courses were served, each with six different dishes, soups and starters, roasts and desserts. The dinner was followed by fruit. Then the king devoted several hours to administering his kingdom. At this period, he liked to work in the apartment of the Marquise de Maintenon, sometimes in company of his ministers. In the apartment of she whom he had secretly married, he found the peace and serenity that was necessary for the accomplishment of his work. For three hours, the king examined dossiers in detail. For the courtiers, this was one of the rare moments of the day when they didn't follow like shadows the sovereign's every movement. Some played cards with a passion. This card table could provide a veritable income, and some did not hesitate to risk royal disfavor by cheating. Others were devoted to games of skill, like billiards or true madame, but brilliant conversation was one of the most highly appreciated pleasures at Versailles. Towards five o'clock in the afternoon, after his work session, the king walked in the gardens and visited the buildings. He joined the courtiers who awaited him in the marble courtyard. Only the privileged were allowed to join in the king's cortege. The group crossed the low gallery and goes to the terrace, then to the water parterre from which point the king liked to spend a few moments admiring the facade of the chateau. From the orangery to the colonnade, the king followed in detail the progression of the different works in progress. The visit ended at Little Venice. The king had gondoliers come from the city of the Doges, and in fine weather, they took the court out on the clear waters of the canal. On summer evenings, it was not unknown for the king to replace supper with a collation prepared for him in one of the groves of the park. Then, when night had fallen, all returned to the chateau for the king's going to bed. Ladies were not invited to attend his going to bed, nor were they invited to attend the rising and robing. The king summoned them to the salon to bid them good night. It is our wish, ladies, that on this night of the solstice, the hours may be propitious to your rest. Your Majesty. Then the going to bed ceremony could really begin. The courtiers who had attended the robing in the morning made it their business to attend. To whom shall the candlestick be given, sir? The king transformed each of his everyday actions into acts of magnanimity. The right to hold the candlestick at his going to bed was given to persons of distinction, often visiting foreigners, who thus acquired the right to accompany the king to his actual bedchamber. But on this evening... The firebrand! The firebrand! Come here, Lalo! Stop this madman! Gentlemen, the Marquis de Scaparella bid you a good night! except even in a dream that the maddest of the mad should destroy this shadow. Play again. It's now or never.
Lalonde, I have spoken with his majesty of your zeal in this matter. The king wishes to compliment you. Monsieur Bonton has told us all about the matter in which you were involved. I feel no anger on seeing the end of this day, which was extraordinary that it should be placed under the sign of the moon rather than that of the sun. Nevertheless, monsieur, you well deserve to be, wherever you go, the ambassador of our time. As soon as the king awakens, Dakin, the first doctor, inquires after his health. Did your majesty sleep well? Was your majesty too hot? Would his majesty like to be rubbed down? Thank you, Dakin. Your majesty has been in perfect health for these last two months. While Bonton washed the king's hands, the family entrance arrived. As they did every morning, Monsieur, the king's brother, Monseigneur, the Dauphin, and the Duke of Maine came to witness the king. Well, my son, what time did you set out to hunt the wolf this morning? 